And now we're going to move on to our guest speaker. And every year we love to have uh, a guest speaker share his or her experiences with the Terry Fox Foundation, with cancer research, etc. And this year is no exception. Uh, Don Konitz was 18 when Terry Fox was running his marathon hope. At the time, Don's mom was undergoing treatment for breast cancer. Uh, helping his mom and cheering for Terry Fox was uh, very, very personal for Don. After school and moved to the West Coast, uh, Don married his sweetheart Catherine and started a family that has since grown to four teenage children, which must be challenging in and of itself if the kids were anything like I was as a teenager. I, I apologize for, for you, for what you have to go through. But there are wonderful children of Brandy Don and Don and Catherine. It's an active lifestyle and outdoor pursuits in their children's upbringing. And the family was a regular at the starting line of the annual Terry Fox Run. By day, Don worked in his own uh, entrepreneurial ventures and his spare time involved himself in coaching and service to many philanthropic and community organizations. Regular medical checkups, a healthy, active lifestyle, and good eating habits were a foundation. But in 2011, at age 48, Don was diagnosed with an aggressive uh, prostate cancer, which he's battling today. Don has met cancer with passion, involvement, and contribution. We are happy that Don is here with us this evening to share his story with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Don Conant. Go Don. Good evening. I have something in common with you. My life has been touched by cancer. We're all here to support and celebrate one of Canada's most inspirational citizens. And we all know the story of the young man who lost his right leg. And in the aftermath of his life-changing cancer diagnosis, decided that he would dream a big dream and run across Canada on one leg. He didn't just dream it. But he did it, and he ran 26 miles a day, and, uh, and in the process gave us all such incredible inspiration. I was 17 when Terry Fox was, uh, was doing his run, and his inspiration was fuel for support for my mom, who was diagnosed with an aggressive breast cancer shortly after Terry's heroic finish. I'll never forget my mom rhyming off the statistics I've got a 50% chance of this, I've got a 50% chance of that. And I had a sort of a typically youthful response of, come on, Mom, we, you know, we can do this, we can, we can beat this, cancer can be beaten. And uh, she actually survived and thrived, and she's alive and well at 76 today. <laughs> the fact is, if you randomly assemble 200 people anywhere in Canada, you're going to have something in common with them as well. And that's because despite the dollars that have been raised, the awareness that's been built, last year there were 186,400 new diagnoses of cancer in Canada and over 75,000 deaths. One in three Canadians will receive a cancer diagnosis in their lifetime. And last November, Statistics Canada reported that Cancer is now the number one cause of death in every province and territory, accounting for 30% of all Canadian deaths. Now, in the face of these statistics, I'm grateful and I'm optimistic. And before any time, we spend any more time staring up cancer's cliff, why don't I tell you a little bit more about myself. I'm from Winnipeg. My dad worked in the family lumber business. I see a few bomber fans out there. <laughs> My mom was an art teacher and I grew up on prairie values. I came from a stable and loving family and enjoyed a clean burning upbringing marked by fitness and outdoor activities. I moved to Vancouver, set up College Pro Painters, which is a business that you may have seen. Uh, if I did a good job painting your house, you can let me know. If I did a bad job, maybe I'll hear about that too. I met a fantastic BC girl and started a family. For any of you that have raised kids, I'm sure you'll agree, the days are long, but the years are short. By last year, I was 48. My kids are 20, 17, 15, and 12. And I like to say I spent the first nine years teaching my kids to walk and talk, and the last nine telling them to sit down and be quiet. <laughs> but in 22 years of marriage, you can count on one hand the number of days I've missed uh, of work. A, Due to, due to sickness. I go to a family doctor, I'm married to a dietitian, and she's helped me to eat well and treat my body with the type of respect that it has offered me. 
But it was last February on an idle Tuesday that I learned that the statistic one in six men get prostate cancer became for me one in one. I'll not ever forget that moment. A diagnosis of cancer does not involve dialing 911, but it is being kidnapped and transported to a lonely place. And for a time I was cornered in that bleak and gravityless existence. For this is a disease for which for many there is no cure. Will I live six months? Will I live six years? Death is a distant rumor to the young. Since that day, I've had surgery, eight weeks of radiation last fall, and today I'm on five drugs. These treatments strike at the heart of masculinity and shake the very pillar of what we talk about when we talk about being a man. Metastatic prostate cancer has brought me a catalog of performance diminishing side effects. Mostly words when you go through them, when you hear them, but beyond language when you go through them. I was and I am scared. Yet, I'm grateful and optimistic. Let me tell you a little bit about why I'm optimistic. Over the last 200 years, Medical research has helped to push the boundaries of our longevity. We now live twice as long as we did 200 years ago. We live longer and we live healthier. Much of the low hanging fruit has been conquered, but cancer is now the greatest threat to our healthy longevity. It's an incredibly complex challenge, but one that the stars are lining up to solve. We've moved so many diseases from fatal to chronic and with cancer now number one, the focus on this disease has never been higher. And not just in Canada. One of the drugs I'm on was fast-tracked, it was founded in the UK and it's been fast-tracked by Health Canada last November and I'm on it today. The prostate is like Bulgaria. Like most men, I know roughly where it is, but don't ask me to point to it on a map. But I learned exactly where it was, and when I reached for help with this unexpected, unwanted, and uncertain diagnosis, I found inspiration and cancer excellence right here in Vancouver. I learned that if I was going to get prostate cancer anywhere in the world, I would want to get it right here on the west side of Vancouver because of the quality of the care, the world-class science here, and the promising research being done. My doctors are among the best in the world. Each of my team have more letters of designation after the, their name than I have in my name. <laughs> I'm optimistic about the fact that there's 130 people working 15 minutes from this golf course on my type of cancer right now. It's the largest concentration of brain power on this cancer anywhere in the world. We've advanced our understanding of cancer and we've made great strides in the last 30 years. Controlling this disease and making it a chronic condition, like we've done with diabetes and AIDS, is on the horizon for many cancers. Survival rates are improving and the BC Cancer Agency enjoys among the best outcomes in the world. I'm optimistic about promising new treatments, some of which are being developed here in Vancouver and being tested worldwide. So there's a few reasons why I'm optimistic. Learning to be grateful required retraining my mind to focus on the silver linings of life. It's not that grateful people don't notice the difficulty of a challenge. It's just when we're grateful, our problems don't disappear. They just occupy less space in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. By being grateful, the difficult, disappointing, and painful commands less of our attention. I've learned through cancer that there's no single more important character trait to happiness than developing a persistent, even automatic, grateful response to life. I wear a yellow wristband. Some of you may wear this or know about it or have seen it. It says Live Strong on it. And I wear it to remind myself of one of my values, which is to be about others, especially those who are suffering from cancer. And there's so many in hospital beds that can't get out of bed and I say to myself when I look at that yellow bracelet that I will do things that cancer patients would long to do like coming to Marine Drive Golf Course on a Monday night and a beautiful sunny night. 
After a couple of weeks of recovering from surgery, in the mail arrived my Vancouver Sunrun entry, which I'd entered before my diagnosis. And my wife encouraged me to do the run. So I went to the start line, sang O Canada, and the gun went off. I started shuffling. I couldn't really run. It was just a few weeks after my surgery. But I finished, and I wrote an email to my doctor that night, and I said to him, you're going to tell three people tomorrow that they have cancer, and I know exactly what that diagnosis sounds like and feels like, but you tell them that you had a patient that four weeks after surgery ran the Vancouver Sun Run, and I realized something so important that day, that someday is today. Weeks have seven days, and not one of them is named someday. If I had two years to live, would I be doing what I'm doing today? Would I be eating what I'm eating today? Is it still serving me to hold that grudge? We all have grudges, I have some. What cancer has taught me is that holding a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. So go, register, sign up, enter, start whatever you need to start to take that course, start that diet, forgive that person that crossed you. It's all about right now. And it's amazing to me how quickly the constraints just fell away the moment I was diagnosed with cancer. Some of you may have gone through radiation treatment. For those of you that don't know it, there's nothing more foreign that you can introduce to a living organism than radiation. I did eight, eight weeks of it every day last fall. Now when I walk by a microwave oven, the clock changes. <laughs> After the first day of radiation, I just wanted to walk in the rich and oxygenated air, and I went up to the North Shore and walked in the forest. I ended up climbing the grouse grind that first day, and it felt so good that I went and climbed the next day and the day after. And each day I got a little slower. Most everyone passed me. But my spirit would soar when the summit would near. And my oncologist pulled my wife aside and said, make sure he knows he's not going to be able to do that for much longer. Well, she told me that on the way to drop me off at the Grouse Grind that afternoon. And I made a commitment to myself that if I could get up there, I would. And so I want patients to know that even though I was scared, and I am scared, in the face of fear, we can find courage. In the face of debilitating circumstances, we can find strength. And I ended up climbing 93,000 vertical feet on Grouse Mountain during those eight weeks, more than three times up Mount Everest. As Terry Fox showed us, people are defined not by what happens, but by what they do with it. So I'm grateful for my friend, Dr. Riley Sempt, who last fall ran across Canada retracing Terry's steps and completing his own run under the Olympic cauldron, which was lit in Riley's honor. My diagnosis was part of Riley's motivation to do the run. I got involved and I helped Riley raise $560,000 for cancer research here in Vancouver. <laughs> I'm grateful for my son, Willie. He's a teenager and who never knew Terry Fox, but he was inspired to do the biggest thing that he could think of. So in May and June, my son Willie rode his bicycle across Canada home from first year university. He called the campaign Gear West and he set a goal of earning $50,000 for cancer research. By the end of the ride, my teenage son had raised $275,000. But, but even more than that, even more than that incredible sum of money, he raised the spirits and hopes of men like me and people that are suffering from cancer. Like being awoken from a sleepwalking existence, cancer has profoundly affected my life in ways that I would never have expected and ways I could never have imagined. For me, even with the uncertainty, I've learned to see cancer as a great gift in my life. Now that it's here, I wouldn't change my experience. I'm challenged inspired and humbled. So while I still have to beat this, I'm grateful for the experience. I'm grateful for the medical care that, it's accessible, that is accessible to me. We are all blessed to live in this great city, the best city, in the best province, in the best country in the world. 
I'm grateful for Terry Fox and for you and for your support tonight. It gives me hope for better days ahead. Most of, this, most of us in this room are not oncologists or cancer researchers, but we are unwitting and vital foot soldiers in the marathon of hope when cancer touches our lives. What we can do is to support events like these. Funds that you raise make a difference. Advance the research, help find the answers, and implement the changes in treatment. So let me finish with this. Mahatma Gandhi once said, be the change in the world you wish to see. So I stand beside Terry Fox and you and say that we can and will meet this test. We can and will find a cure. My children and your children will live in a cancer-free world, and Vancouver will be the home to this holy grail. We will find the finish line to the marathon of hope. Terry Fox would expect no less. Thank you. been one of the most incredible sharing of events, sharing of, of experiences. And I know that through my work with Terry Fox Foundation, I'm probably going to talk to you about sharing that maybe a few more times if you can, because that was just so inspiring. I'm looking around the room with some, some wet eyes and some, uh, some uh, hopeful eyes as well. So, Don, thank you very, very, very much for sharing that with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.